Welcome, everybody. We are so excited to see you here. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to start off the introductions and then Prue's going to take over in just a few minutes. Um, so my name is Amber Johnston. I'm the Director of Volunteer Services at the Upper Valley Haven, which is located in White River Junction, Vermont, but right on the border of New Hampshire. Um, the Haven assists those who are experiencing poverty to be free from hunger, securely housed, and pursue a self-directed life. So we run two year-round shelters. We have the second largest food shelf in the state of Vermont. We do children's programming. Um, we do a lot of community support to prevent homelessness. And we do problem solving to anybody who comes to us. We have no economic or geographic restrictions and serve um, about 51% from Vermont and 49% of individuals from New Hampshire. And we work with about 15,000 individuals every single year. Core to the Haven is our volunteers. We rely on them. They're woven into all aspects of our services. We, at any given moment, have about 450 active volunteers and pre-COVID would have over 1500 individuals set foot on our campus to vol volunteer with us in the course of a year. Last year, our volunteers gave 18,796 hours. So our volunteer program is really important to us um, and we're excited to do, I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, here. Um, and just to give you a sense of why we believe or why I believe this topic is really, really important. Um, including individuals with lived experience in your volunteer program allows your organization to provide a higher quality service. A diverse volunteer base is essential to be able to view issues through multiple lenses, and it allows for more effective programs and brings your organization closer to its mission. Um, lived experience is lived expertise. Prue and I will both be presenting on this together. Um, we're excited to leave you with practical solutions and personal stories. We will have two breakout rooms, as was mentioned, one sort of partway through and a short one at the end. Um, and we do encourage questions. We both really like that. So please feel free to pop anything into the chat. Uh, we want to know. We're going to now um, to do a poll because we're interested in where your organization sits. And it also, if you have anything you're really looking for from the session, feel free to put that in the chat. Prue and I will both be monitoring it. Uh, we want to make sure that what we're giving you is information that is responsive to what you're looking for. So let's see what it looks like. So really interesting to see where organizations sit um, with, with this. Interesting that um, I can say that for the Haven, we intentionally recruit volunteers with lived experience but we don't actually have any on our board. It's something we're gonna talk about. It's great to see that many do have um, individuals with lived experience on the board. And then also um, that you have individuals with lived experience, but not targeted outreach. That's something we're gonna talk about today as well. Um, great, thank you for doing this. This is wonderful to see. And I'm gonna turn it over to Prue. So good morning, everyone. So my name is Prue Pease. And as Amber said, I'm currently the director of Work United. That is an initiative of Granite United Way. Um, I am based in our Upper Valley office. And, and I wanna tell you a little bit about what Work United does. Um, 2014, Granite United Way looked around our community and said, uh, what we see is on the far left-hand side of our community, we have a group of people and when a crisis comes to them, they have uh, used or accessed some type of program in the community before, and they know how to access those services. On the far right-hand side of our continuum, we have a whole group of people who have been very successful and over the course of their life, through their work, have been able to build resources and skills. And when a crisis comes to those individuals, they also can map a plan on how to resolve that crisis. But for the most part, the greatest part of the Upper Valley are people who live day to day. And when crisis comes to their door, they are completely bewildered as to what, which door to knock on and how to access those services. So in 2015, uh, Work United was born. Uh, we are now embedded in 13 companies in the Upper Valley. We provide on-site resource coordination service. Uh, which means if you're an employee in one of those companies and you have any type of glitch in your life, childcare, transportation, housing, medical, access to prescriptions, you want to go to college, 
anything in your life that glitches for you and for anybody in your family, you can see us during your work time. And then we can help you begin to move forward. So we are embedded in uh, 13 companies in the Upper Valley. Our services are available to 10,000 employees. So that's pretty cool. That's my number one job these days. My number two job, for any of you who have ever heard of Bridges Out of Poverty, Bridges Out of Poverty is national training. And I have been a national consultant with Bridges now for 12 years. So before COVID, uh, it was not unusual for me to do 30 or 35 presentations over the course of the year, uh, at least two a month, sometimes three and four, uh, and, and talk about the effect of poverty. So why is this important? And why is this discussion so important to me today? Um, and, and part of that is because it's based in where I came from. So for any of those of you who have ever heard me present, you know that I come with a pretty significant background story that sounds kind of like this. I was born into extreme poverty in Massachusetts. By the time I was 11 years old, I had lived in 10 places. By the time I was 12 years old, I was no longer living with my family, but I was on my own in the community. How many of you can identify that teenager who's living pretty much unsupervised in the community. By 18, I was married, married to the road captain of the Hells Angels. And by 22, I had four children. I had a four-year-old, a three-year-old, a two-year-old, and a one-year-old in my care. Okay, how many of you have seen me? Well, in my community, I was labeled as a parent with no potential. I was a poverty parent. I had low skills. I had lots of children. I had um, everything that would make me a nightmare to your community. And then somebody came into my life, uh, a, a worker, somebody who I knew from uh, an agency who provided services to me, um, who saw me as more than I could see myself. And in Bridges Out of Poverty, we refer to those individuals as bridgers, people who see you as more than you see yourself, okay? So my eldest child, Nick, was in Head Start and uh, Nick had been diagnosed with autism. He didn't speak, he didn't dress himself, he didn't feed himself, uh, he didn't say mama. Most of the time he sat in the corner and he rocked and he growled and I was, pretty much mandated to put my son Nick into Head Start. And so in September, we started in Head Start that year and I was assigned a Head Start home visitor. And every week, this woman came to my house and interacted with me and my son Nick and, and life started. And in September, she said to me, Prue, I'd really like you to come and join the parents group. And I said, no, no, that's not for me. In October, she said to me, Prue, I'd really like for you to come and join our parents group. And again, I declined. In November, she asked, would you please come and join the parents group? Nope, nope, I declined. And in December here in Vermont, it's pretty cold, but I decided I wanted to go to this parents group. So I drove my car 45 minutes to where the meeting was happening and I pulled up and I had neither the courage I just couldn't get out of the car. I could not get out of my car. And so I sat for two hours in the parking lot and I watched the meeting through the window. And at the end of the meeting, I drove home and I never said anything to the home visitor. And so in January, again, she started every week to ask me to come to the, the parents group. Prue, I think you could really come to the parents group. No, no. But in January, I once again tried to get to that parents group and I drove to the meeting. And as I sat in my car outside of that meeting and watched through the window as I was smoking my cigarette, because this is now 37 years ago, as I sat in the car smoking my cigarette, I dropped my cigarette. And we all know if you drop your cigarette when you're smoking in the car, you only have two options because it's either gone under the seat or it's fallen into your lap. Either way, if you don't find the cigarette, something is gonna catch on fire. 
So I opened my door and I looked for that cigarette. And when I opened that door, the inside car light came on. And that home visitor who was running the meeting inside saw me sitting there in my car. She was a very smart woman. She did not come out to the car and get me. She let me stay in the car for the whole rest of the night. She never said boo that she saw me. And when she started to come back to, to visit with me in February, she never told me that she saw me. And two weeks passed and she talked about, oh, Prue, why don't you come to the parents group? And then she said to me, Prue, you know, I've been really swamped at work and I really don't have time to fix the snack for the parents group. Do you think you could come over early this week and help me prepare the snack for parents group? It would mean a huge amount to me. Do you think I went and helped to prepare the snack? Yes, I did. When the meeting started and I came out of the kitchen and I was carrying my snack tray to put it down, one of the participants actually looked at me and said, what are you doing here? And I got to look at him and I said, I I'm helping Mary. I'm helping Mary. And people let me come into the meeting and nobody talked to me, but I sat there and I participated. And that was in February. And in March and in April and in May, I went every month and prepared snack for Mary. Okay. And the next year, when that parents group formed, I went every week. I didn't have to prepare the snack anymore, but I went every week. And the next year, they asked for someone to be selected from the parents group to become a policy council rep. So if any of you know Head Start, you have individual parent groups, and then you have policy council. And they asked me if I would sit on policy council. And I said, yes. And so I not only went to parents group, but I went to Barry, Vermont once a, once a month for a meeting. That was really exciting for me. And I participated on policy council for two years. And the year after that, I was president of the CVCIC policy council. That was exciting. Two years after that, I represented Vermont on the region one board of directors at the JFK building in Boston. And every eight weeks, I drove to Boston to participate in a meeting and represent my state. And a year after that, I was elected to the National Head Start Board of Directors. And for the next two years, I served in Washington, DC. I traveled all over the country. I've had dinner in the Rose Garden three times. I have been a guest of one of the presidents of the United States. And that is how my career began. It began because somebody saw me as more than I saw myself. Somebody bridged for me. Somebody saw me as a participant in that parents group. Somebody saw me and they projected me to be on policy council. When I was on policy council, they projected me that I could be the region one rep. Okay. Where did my world go from there? When I, so what I didn't tell you is I'm also the retired senior side judge of Orange County, Vermont, a position that I held for eight years. I went from welfare mom to being a judge. And the only thing that was listed on my resume, there was not a paid employment on my resume for 20 years. All there was, was volunteering. And I served uh, in Head Start. I served on the Community Action Board of Directors. I served on the Vermont Low Income Advocacy Council. I served on the board of the Family Place here in the Upper Valley. I served as the Orange County uh, Parent Child Center Board. I served um, for the Vermont Economic Development Authority. My whole career was based on my volunteer services, okay? It started with simple somebody seeing me as more than I see myself. And so when we talk about volunteering, when I talk about volunteering, I think of two things. I think of, ooh, we're going to get volunteers and we're going to do something for our community and the community will benefit. Or I think about the next level and I said, oh, we're going to get volunteers and they're going to help my agency and my agency is going to benefit. 
okay? Or we think about volunteers. We think about, oh, volunteers are gonna, gonna help uh, one of my clients with their survival. We're gonna help them get a food shelf or we're gonna come to their house and, and do some work. But how often do each of you think about volunteering as a way to create a career for someone, as a way to bridge someone into finding their voice, their leadership in, you, in your community. How often does that cross your mind? Because if people had not stopped, if people had not seen me as more than I see myself, I would never have reached where I am today, okay? It is so important. So when we talk about volunteering, I think what Amber and I hope for you to come away with today is a different idea about how you grow a volunteer, okay? How you grow a volunteer, how you grow a volunteer into that leadership role into your community. And it is 10.50, Amber. I hit my mark. So for those of you who don't know, it is I start to talk and it's very difficult to get me to stop talking. So the fact that it is 10.50, Amber, and I am on track, woohoo, it's back to you. And feel free to ask questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we will definitely get to them. <laughs> You're amazing. I um, <clears throat> So we are now going to do our first breakout session because we're interested to get you talking to each other. Um, and so our first breakout session is going to be, let me share our screen. Um, we're going to put you into groups of about four or five. Um, and just to discuss the following questions, does your organization currently engage volunteers with lived experience? If so, what are your successes um, and where might be areas of challenge? And then if not, what are some of the barriers that you've experienced? Um, and we will bring everybody back with about 10 minutes, so just around 11 o'clock. We, in essence of time, we weren't going to necessarily debrief out um, about the conversations, but if you have anything you want to share in the chat, please feel free. We are interested to hear if you learned anything new or if you had any thoughts that would be helpful for later or just kind of comments. Um, and we are going to do a second poll um, as just a way of getting an understanding of maybe some of the items that were talked about around what um, what areas or what sort of things your organization is currently doing. So that poll can go up and you can choose multiple options. So please choose everything that applies. Awesome information. It's so interesting to see that the board is structured to include individuals as sort of one of the top ones. Um, systems for regular volunteer feedback and analysis. Oh, I'm so excited for that conversation. Interesting that that targeted recruitment still is a little bit lower um, and volunteers being included in program design. We still have systems for regular volunteer feedback as has 52% is the highest one. So, yep, you can see that there's sort of a variety. It's great to see all of the ways that your organizations are currently um, using that, that systems for feedback is really high, um, that you know, board inclusion is really high, um, advisory council. I'm so excited to hear about that. That's something we're um, gonna start implementing yet. And um, yeah, volunteer-led programming and services being high as well, everything. That's great, thank you. I wanted to move forward and just talk a little bit about some of the structural things that the Haven has put in place since we started intentionally doing this work. Um, and then we're gonna turn it back over to prove. So, so one of the first areas that the Haven really looked at was our recruiting. Um, it was really important to us that we were sort of analyzing our recruiting methods. And so we started by looking at where we stood um, and we had tended to use kind of the same tried and true system. So we, listservs were really big in our area. We tended to use listservs, um, word of mouth and newspaper ads were our really go-to. Um, and so we started thinking about who are we missing? How is this leaving, you know, huge groups of individuals out? And so we started doing flyers in community spaces. Um, we also looked at the language of our flyers, but um, targeted outreach to community organizations where we didn't have representation in our volunteer pool. Um, we sent it out to our current volunteers and said, hey, do you know people who are missing, you know, who would want to volunteer with us? Um, and then we also, we believe we're a pretty data heavy organization. And so we periodically run demographic reports on our volunteer base to see if there are gaps. And a lot of what we also look for is um, geographic representation because we want volunteers from the communities um, where individuals come to use our services. And so that's something that we'll, we use that also to hit some targeted outreach. And that's been really, really helpful. 
Um, we was really focused on our language around it. And so we went to task focused. We, we sort of moved away from using the word volunteering every single time. I think some of the feedback we got was that the word volunteering could be a barrier. Um, and so we might use help your community and really kind of focused on the tasks that's needed. And so, um, for instance, if we're looking for volunteers for our food shelf, we'll be really specific. We're looking for somebody who can commit two hours a week, Monday through Thursday, you know, from three to five to help stock food and put it on shelves. And that way somebody knows what they're doing. They might think to themselves, you know, I'm not a person who volunteers, but yeah, I'm, I'm actually not busy from three to five. And I definitely, you know, enjoy sort of putting food away. That sounds great. Um, or if we're looking for somebody to make a meal to really focus on, you know, would you like to prepare a meal, um, you know, for guests living in, in the shelter. Or really, and we try to make the language clear. We try to make it transparent. Um, we review our standard recruiting posts uh, with our current volunteers just to see if they're accessible, if they're inclusive. Um, we run them by our board as well, just really interested. We recently received an awesome suggestion to include people with lived experience are encouraged to apply. And that's something we will be moving forward with in all of our recruiting. Um, we always have focused on flexibility, but we um, recently, a couple of years ago, moved to a volunteer management software uh, platform that has decreased some barriers because you, you can manage, it's easier for volunteers who have access to internet. Um, however, we still maintain that there's always somebody in the office who can talk to anyone who's interested in volunteering, either by phone or in person. Um, I'm constantly, you know, it takes priority. If I'm in a meeting and somebody walks in and is interested in volunteering, I will leave my meeting in order to talk to them. Um, we always have paper applications that are printed. So if somebody doesn't have access to a computer or feels more comfortable with that, um, always offer those. And then we also offer individuals who could help fill it out if that was a barrier. Um, and we have many volunteers who just don't feel comfortable and then we just bypass the management software and do it ourselves. And we've built that into our staff time. Um, and so just trying to make our application process uh, as adaptable as possible and as, a, as easy as possible. Um, and I think that having someone available, we're very much of a relationship-based organization. And so it's really important to us that um, all of our volunteers feel really welcomed on a personal level. Um, then we also looked at our onboarding. And so for volunteer individuals who are interested, we do one-to-one -one meetings with all potential new volunteers and we budget out an hour and I've talked to people for up to two, depending on the person and really focusing on what are their strengths? What are they interested in? What are they hoping to get out of volunteering? Um, how can that match with the needs of our organization? And as Prue mentioned, there's various things and there's sometimes volunteers where we see potential in areas they might not have, or through a conversation, a strength emerges that they weren't thinking of as a strength that can be really beneficial to us. And so, although we've had some, you know, recommendations for um, time management around doing group orientation of volunteers, this is a practice that we will never let go of, that it allows us to know all of our volunteers. It means that our volunteer coordinator has a personal relationship with every single person. Um, we also then use that so when once a person has volunteered once or twice, we do a, a phone call and just say, how is it going? And it's from the volunteer coordinator. So they have a relationship and then they have that follow-up of how did it feel? Did the training go well? Do you have any feedback for us? Um, and so ensuring that that happens is really important to us. We talk a lot about shared language initially. Um, it's something that we focus on with our staff, but also for our volunteers. And that way our volunteers know when staff are using certain language, uh, what it means. And so we have a, a lot of conversations around shared language, both on the higher level in terms of um, individuals who come to our food shelf, we, we call them customers, to sort of, you know, more um, tailored language for the position that they're engaging in because they have so much contact with individuals um, who use our services. It's really important to us that they also have a shared language that they experience when they come to the Haven. We do check-ins with all of our new volunteers and our opportunities are designed around building community. So we put people into teams. We have very few things where somebody's just kind of alone in a room doing something by themselves. It's really important to us. A lot of our volunteers use this as a, you know, really gain from the community. And especially um, when we can match diverse volunteer teams, 
it's an incredible. So the other day I was walking through our food shelf and there was, um, we have a whole bunch of rotten potatoes currently, like any of one potato goes bad the entire bag. You just, it's not good probably. Um, and so we've been going through bags of potatoes. I will forever smell like rotten potatoes. And Next to, we had a retired Dartmouth professor, we're very close to Dartmouth College, who was sorting with one of our current shelter guests. And they were having this awesome conversation about rotten potatoes. And I was thinking to me, like, that is really what we're looking for in our volunteer services, which is building community over shared tasks that allow everyone to feel that they're using their strengths within that. Lastly, uh, for our onboarding, I just wanted to mention that we um, include pronouns and all name tags. We ask it as part of our volunteer application form and then just automatically put it on the name tag. So it's just part of our, um, part of our process. I am now gonna take a break Hold on. and I'm gonna turn it back over to Prue. So my hope is that at this point, all of you are starting to think about volunteers on so many levels in your uh, agency. And, and that's what I see uh, that happens at the Haven in Amber's agency, is that uh, they have a wide variety of, of volunteering positions. And truly, I don't, I don't like to be asked to volunteer. When we talk about things like program design, I really like people to say to me, Prue, I'd like to offer you a leadership opportunity. I would really like you to be able to bring your voice to the table. Um, and sometimes those relationships have happened for me while I was sorting potatoes. Um, you know, one of, one of my favorite stories um, is that I was, I was doing a volunteer task um, and the person who was working at the table beside me was somebody I had, had never uh, met before. Um, and, I, and I had a newborn baby and she was holding the baby for me and a conversation, you know, developed and life was going on. And, and we worked together for two or three hours. And at the end of our time together, she handed me her card and she said, you know, I am the Secretary, Secretary of State for the state of Vermont. And I would really like to uh, help you find your voice in this other area. Okay. I had no idea that I was sitting beside the Secretary of the state of Vermont because we were doing a task very similar to sorting potatoes. Um, but I really wanna go back to my bridging concept. Um, and, and I want you to take a minute and think about who do you see in your organization? Who do you see where you see their potential and they, the individual doesn't see their potential yet? Do you see it? Can you pick that person out? Because I really want to, challenge you to to change your, your thoughts from just volunteering to leadership opportunities in your agency how do you take that lived experience and now that somebody's volunteering and they feel safe in your agency how do you reach out and incorporate more of their experience how do you take them to those next steps of, of becoming involved in your agency is that with program design? Is it on the board? If you are sitting on the board, you want to hear a great board story? You know, I was on a board. I was on policy council and, and I was in a big meeting and there's probably 25 people in the meeting. And I looked at them and I said, you know, every month we come and talk to, about the fact that admin needs more money. Admin needs more money. I've gone through the whole building and I can't find Mr. Admin's office any place. Okay, so where did you hide him? Who is Mr. Admin and why do we need to pay him more money? Ooh, what does it mean when admin needs more money? The administration needs more money. But I didn't know. Didn't know. Sat on that board for months and didn't know the lingo. Didn't know what was being talked about. Um, so, so as you're thinking about people that you can move from volunteering to that leadership development piece. Uh, what are you doing to support that growth? Who, who are you bridging for? Um, and I think I can identify who I'm bridging for. I think if I said to Amber, Amber, pull three people off of your volunteer list who you see have more potential than they see. She could pull them for me. Okay, can you pull that? Okay, and what are your steps going to be? How are you going to increase that 
uh, participation in your specific agency. How is that going to work for you? Okay, so those are some of my thoughts. Um, and boy, nobody said anything in chat. Hmm. Um, oh, we but, had but, one question. Okay. Which was um, sort of what is meant by, by life experience? It's such a broad term and it could be applied in so many different ways. And of course it is definitely, you know, gradation. And, and so that was one of the questions that has come up, which I think is a great one. Um, and so when I think about life experience, um, I think about having a balance. And one of the things that we talk about in Bridges is that all voices are, are important at the table. If you're going to build a strong program that can truly respond to the needs of your community, um, you need to make sure that that voice is diverse. That yes, we have people who come from middle class who have lived experience, but that you also have people you're providing services to and having them talk about lived experience. Um, what's it like in the community? What's it like to use that service? Okay. I talk a lot. Uh, the Haven is, is one of the, the places I give the most referrals to. I refer people almost daily to use the programs at, at Amber's facility. Um, and I talk to them about what works and what doesn't work. Okay. Don't go and pick up your food shelf at 1230 because the coolers are going to be empty. Okay, so you either want to get there at 1030 or you want to get there at two, but at 1230, they, there's not going to be a big selection in the cooler. Um, and people look at me and they go, oh, you know that? That's my lived experience. Okay, that is my experience. How does it work? How does it, it not work? What did it feel like to me? Um, and in and, and Bridges, we teach a lot about that. Um, and, and those, how important those voices are from the individuals who are using your services, not just those people who think they know what services need to be delivered. And Joan, do you have up your hand? Did you want to ask a question? Um, no. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that I, I wasn't passing that over. Um, did that help, Amber? Um, ha, now you're the one who's muted. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and really, how do, how do we grow that word from being a volunteer to uh, a leadership opportunity? How do you grow that individual? Um, and, and how do you look, because a lot of time when I think of volunteers, I think of people who are older. I think of people who have passed through the prime of their life, who might be retired, who have time on their hands and want to volunteer. I think about people who are financially stable and they want to give back to their, their community. So they're on one end of the spectrum. How do you then offer supports to those people who want to be involved from the other end of the spectrum? Those young people, those, those people who might be lost in their community right now. Um, so I will turn it back to you, Amber. Puda is so important. And I think um, one of the reasons that I love doing anything with Prue, but that I really also love this is that I think where the Haven is at is sort of in the beginnings of what systems do we put in place to get people in the door, right? So I talked about onboarding and recruiting, just the kind of basics. And then where Prue takes it is, and what are the possibilities? Where do you go with this? And it is so amazing um, to hear Prue's story. And I know others, right? Who have also that volunteering has served this. And um, one of the power that I believe in at the Haven is that through our first meeting, we can really see what an individual might need. So a lot of people volunteer with us in order to get a reference for a job because they might be new. Um, and so when we talked about targeting, recruiting, we get a lot of Dartmouth students. They're really awesome. It's close to us. We appreciate it. We started reaching out to the community colleges, to a friend of mine who's working in Keene with individuals who are the first in their family to go to, to college and look at how do we then target other individuals who might who you know, we could provide a service for in order to then launch into the job market. It's how I got experience. I volunteered when I was in college and when I was then looking for jobs, I could say that I had applied work, right? And so um, some of it, what we do is look at 
what needs are our volunteer services filling and how do we expand those needs out beyond the demographic that we're just instantly seeing that come to us. Um, one area that we do this is just through accessibility. And so um, we provide all needed materials. We have individuals who cook from home. We provide all the food and the pans. Um, we just really never want cost or transportation to be a barrier. Uh, one of the great things about COVID is it helped us um, rethink about some of our, we were four, we're very like Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 5 p.m. or the majority of our volunteer services. And with COVID, we really rethought that and started building in weekend and evenings and early mornings. We had individuals who were like, I am a morning person, 7.30 works well for me. And we have a staff person's like, I could come in then that works well too. So adjusting our volunteer hours according and still meeting our needs, but also being more flexible about them. Um, it's been really huge. And so we shifted our gardening, which used to happen on Wednesday afternoon to also include a Saturday shift. So, so individuals who wanted to come, it's been a great way to get high school students um, or parents and kids involved and in getting to do it. We have a huge edible landscape, which is all organic ground uh, gardens. We have 80 different fruits, vegetables, and herbs tended all by volunteers. Um, and those have been really nice ways of getting additional volunteers in. We also have um, due to our really high staff to volunteer ratio, we have a 10 to one. So we have 10 volunteers for every one staff member. And so most of the people who come to our service are engaging with a volunteer. And some of our volunteer programs, such as our food shelf, which can have up to 170 active volunteers with one and a half staff people. So if you think of the level of support that our staff are able to provide our volunteers, it's very low. And so we designed a team leader model where we have volunteers who have sort of stepped up as a, uh, to provide additional mentoring. So we can have volunteers who might need a little extra support in different areas. Um, it's allowed us to take younger volunteers so we can take you know 15 year olds in our food shelf because we can pair them with an older and more seasoned volunteer. And it's been a great way to get high school students. Um, we also accept anybody, and that's really important to us. Um, we accept individuals with felonies. Um, we accept anything. The only, we have one barrier, and that is just if a person um, has committed a sexual offense, then we, because we run a family shelter, A, they can't volunteer on site, and we would probably still help them figure it out. We just believe in volunteering and finding a way that matches strengths. That doesn't mean that every single person who comes to us to volunteer finds exactly what they're looking for. We do have individuals who come really looking to meet a need that isn't one that we have, right? It is always a give and take. And those who do volunteer coordination know that you are always balancing the needs of the organizations, the interests of the organizations and your needs of your volunteer. And I think that I often think of it as a, a big swing and sometimes you meet maybe the needs of the volunteer a little more than the needs of the organization. And sometimes it's the other way around. And that's huge and important and creates community. Um, so I also just wanted to talk about, I think one of the, one of the really key areas for us and, and Prue talked about it also, like, you know, it's been really key for her engagement and then I'll share the screen for this one. But it's so nice not to share screen, that's okay. Um, which is just including feedback systems. So just making sure that you're listening to your volunteers. And this is something um, that the Haven has been really focused in, uh, focused on, which is we've intentionally established formal and informal communication loops. So we tend to use, we use surveys. Um, and one of our areas of growth is how to expand past <laughs> survey reliance, but um, we both do in-person and targeted ones. We then post all of the findings. We're completely transparent about our surveys and we send it out to all of our volunteers. We highlight um, what was raised during these surveys. We really focus on the changes that were made based on their input and include suggestions that were not acted on and why they weren't. And I think it's really important not to leave that piece of it off. It makes a huge difference. Um, we're in the early stages of developing a centralized system for recording all feedback that we receive. We really want to use it to identify trends over time, um, to track areas of improvement if we do have, you know, identified issues. And we're pretty excited about this as a way of um, being able to kind of more centralize our feedback so it doesn't just sort of feel that we're always sort of trying to tie it together. Um, we have staff committees which are led by non-leadership staff. We have six of them. They're very key to the Haven. Um, they affect our programming and they're where um, programming decisions 
tend to eat, originate and also go to for staff input, and we open them up to volunteers. And so we have two to three volunteers who sit on each of these committees. And um, it's been a wonderful way to engage strengths of our volunteers in um, the leadership of the Haven. It's been really nice. Um, we do quarterly pulse surveys for our volunteers. We also do a quarterly newsletter where an entire section, which is in the same part, always just highlights changes that we made to our programs based on volunteer suggestions. And they can be as big as right outside my window. We have a, um, because we're still offering curbside, we have a hut uh, where volunteers are doing registration. Um, and that was a volunteer idea. And so we're like, yeah, that's great. We found other volunteers to build it and to implement it. Um, and so it, it's everything from, you know, sort of structural changes of the organization to things like, hey, we think the wording on our food shelf registration forms, we don't think it's accessible. Can we relook at this language? Um, and so it's really important to us that, that I think that feeding back the impact of, feed, of, of changes that you made encourages more volunteers. And what we have seen is the more we focus on that, the more feedback we get, which is pretty awesome. And then lastly, I just wanted to highlight that the Haven is still growing and we're definitely sort of focused on best practices and we have a number of areas of growth. And one is that we wanna improve our feedback system. So as I mentioned, we're very survey heavy. We really, we're now looking at, um, and we need to recruit individuals with lived experience for our board. And that has been an area that the Haven is now focused on. Um, and our board is, is doing the work to start engaging in that. We're also in the early stages of developing a volunteer panel, which is why I was so interested that some places have an advisory panel, um, which will do program volunteer oversight. I'd love them to review program decisions or changes within volunteer services and review our written material. Um, and we really are focused on how do we ensure that our panel represents our entire volunteer base. And so that's going to be our next, we're currently in, in discussions around that. So anyone who's done this work, if you have ideas on best practices or lessons you learned, please, I will put my contact information in the chat. I would love to talk and sort of um, collect ideas. I, uh, and then lastly, the Haven relies on, we, we rely on sort of the informal conversations to understand um, the lived experience of our volunteers. And so we don't have any formal mechanisms for asking. Um, and that is how it is right now and something that we are looking at. But um, right now it would only be if a person shares their experience while we are having meetings with them. So that's a little bit about the Haven. We are, bro, I think we're like right on time, if not a few minutes. Yeah, right on time. The only thing that I would say is when, when you leave us and you go back is when you think about volunteering, think out of the box. Think out of the box. I think the Haven thinks out of the box all the time on how to uh, encourage volunteers, how to reach out to volunteers, how to make volunteers feel supported and how to help those volunteers grow um, both within their agency and individually. I mean, I think that's huge. So think out of the box, think about what you're doing and then think out of the box. And we are gonna give you a chance to um, do that right now. So for our last breakout session, we were just gonna put you in, in smaller groups, again, maybe around four, three, four, um, and just take five minutes on how you could use this information. What is one way you could think of out of the box for your organization? What is one idea that you have that you could carry this forward? And just to make, you know, just to share it out. Um, and then we'll come back and please, if you have questions, think, write them in the chat. Prue and I now have a few minutes. I think we both love discussion. So please, you know, either pop them in the chat, but we'll go to the breakout session first and then come back and have, you know, just a, about five to seven more minutes to discuss. That's awesome. Welcome back. Uncharacteristically, Prue and I, now we have a few extra minutes and we would love to have any conversation or discussion. Please feel free to share in the chat or unmute yourself and share. Um, does anyone have anything they would like to, to ask a question about or comment on? Yeah. Well, I think one of the things, this is Tara, uh, that we were just talking about in our room briefly was also, uh, is there any cross, uh, volunteering that we can do. So Willing Hands was just talking about 
uh, how, how and where do they reach out for recruitment? And I'm looking from the perspective of Girl Scouts going, hey, maybe we could reach out to each other. And here's another way that we can find like-minded organizations and share and learn from each other as well. That's, thank you, that's awesome. And um, just to follow up on that, so we have, Sarah's actually part, it's amazing, we have a volunteer coordinators network here where we have, I think right now, currently 15 different nonprofits just in the upper valley that meet and talk about these ideas because I agree with you. The more you can um, minimize barriers and little do they know, but we're having a meeting, actually Sarah knows because we're planning it, but we're having a meeting in June and we're gonna start talking. I'm really interested in the idea of shared education. So if we're doing things like um, an implicit bias training for our volunteers, is there a way to not have to have them repeat? Like, could we just kind of do shared education across volunteers? But we've had some neat ideas. Like we do a joint up volunteer appreciation uh, now. So I think we have about 350 people that attend from across the upper valley. And there's been some neat ideas. That's awesome. Um, I have one quick thing to add is um, I'm putting the link here on our Volunteer NH website um, in our Volunteer Resource Center. Uh, we just launched this um, online like forum called Basecamp for volunteer administrators. Um, so it's it's new. Um, the link is in the chat and you can kind of collaborate, ask questions. Um, or I think we're hoping to get more people to sign on to that so we can have some of those conversations. I just wanted to thank you guys both. And I think that um, just hearing how devoted you are to the, the onboarding and the personal conversations with every volunteer, because I know how many volunteers there are at the Haven is really resonating. And I'm like, oh man, I have a lot of work to do. But that's that's something that I hope you know grows more into our organization because I think that's so important. And you make the connections with people that you would otherwise miss if it was just a quick email. Um, but yeah, it takes time and time is important to build relationships. Thanks, that's what resonated with me. I think that relationships are so important on every level, every level. Um, and how valuable each of you are. Um, it, not to let that uh, go unspoken. Um, everybody who is here um, is valuable. If, if people had not reached out and tapped me, I would not be where I am today. Um, so how do you cultivate those relationships? How do you do that? Um, and I think that's just exceptional. I also, um, oh, I just had a thought. Oh, the other thing I was thinking that we've done a little bit and that actually Sarah doesn't know, but I'm about to send her an email about is is when we have volunteer groups, I don't know if you get large volunteer groups, we can't always take the, the full size of them. So um, if they're, you know, 15 people for us, it's, it's a lot with our regular ongoing volunteers. And so um, splitting them up, we have a wonderful um, YMCA camp that wants to come this summer and the concept of having them volunteer at multiple places who have shared um, mission. And so I was saying to them that it'd be great if we sort of had them maybe half with us, half with willing hands, we both talk about access to food and to start with an education around what does food insecurity look like in our area? and how does it exist, especially a lot of these students be from New York City. And so this will be um, a new introduction to rural poverty. And so that's been a nice way of collaborating and again, you know, sort of minimizing efforts. I think that sounds great. 